On the 7th of October 2023, Israel suffered the darkest day in its 75 years of existence. In what's been described as the darkest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust, thousands of jihadist terrorists poured into the country and began a rampage of horrors. Members of Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Gazan citizens entered the towns and kibbutzes around the Gaza Strip and committed acts of brutality worthy of ISIS. Men, women and children were slaughtered in cold blood. Many of them were tortured and women were defiled in unspeakable ways. A music festival with thousands of young people became the scene of a nightmare as hundreds of them were slain by Hamas, with the corpses being taken back to Gaza and paraded as trophies where they were jeered and spat on. How did an inferior enemy get through one of the world's most militarized borders and overcome an a billion dollar security wall that had been built to prevent precisely this happening? Israel has one of the finest intelligence services in the world. Did they really know nothing of this attack? As we will see, Israel knew in advance about the October 7th attacks. And although their intelligence didn't give them a specific date, they had detailed information of Hamas's war plans. But no action was taken and the greatest intelligence failure in the country's history took place. The failure is best thought of as an iceberg. The recent events and the key players that made decisions are only the tip of the iceberg. It goes far deeper than this. This debacle was decades in the making. It's the story of a military society, its aristocracy, the arrogant and complacent generals who misunderstood a sadistic and fanatical enemy and led their country to disaster. Welcome back to History Revealed. I'm Joel and I'm thrilled to be making long form content again. This war between Israel and Hamas has taken up our attention for the past few months and I hope you enjoy my analysis of it. If you like the video, click the like button, please subscribe, share it with your friends if you get value from it. Your support is much, much appreciated. It's how this channel grows, it's how it sustains itself. So now we're done with that, let's get on with the video. Since the October 7th attack took place, many in Israel and throughout the world reacted with shock, not just against the horrors that Hamas committed, but also wondering out loud, how on earth could such a large scale assault take place against Israeli soil without Israel having any advanced knowledge of it. The Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, is considered among the best in the world, as are Israel's intelligence services, the feared Mossad and Shin Bet. So how is it possible that these organizations with such formidable reputations had no knowledge of events? A combination of investigative journalists, serving and former Israeli soldiers, have begun to shed light on this intelligence failure examining what Israel knew and why the information wasn't acted upon. It's important to note we are in relatively early days. The attacks of October the 7th will be examined for years to come. There'll no doubt be inquiries and lengthy investigations, so we're only working on the information that has emerged so far, which will inevitably increase in the future. So the New York Times published a lengthy article claiming that Israel knew of Hamas's attack plan more than a year ago, and it goes into astonishing detail of just what Israel was aware of. It claims that Israel possessed a 40-page document, codenamed Jericho Wall, named after the biblical story where Joshua destroyed the walls of Jericho. Now, in this document, it is claimed that there was detailed knowledge of what Hamas's methods were for attacking Israel. Hamas followed the blueprints with shocking precision. The document called for a barrage of rockets at the outset of the attack, drones to knock out the security cameras and automated machine guns along the border and gunmen to pour into Israel en masse in paragliders, on motorcycles and on foot, all of which happened on October the 7th. The details about paragliders is particularly interesting because this truly was unprecedented in Hamas's attacks against Israel. Hamas's blueprint also contained information about the size and location of Israel's forces, as well as sensitive communications information, all raising questions of just how Hamas got their hands on this information. Although the document was circulated widely amongst Israel's military and intelligence leaders, the plan was considered aspirational and beyond the capabilities of Hamas, a clear failing of imagination on the part of Israel's security establishment. Like any good Shakespearean tragedy, this story has heroes and villains. And in Israel's case, the main villain is this man, Major General Aharon Khaliva, head of IDF military intelligence also known as Amman. In his role, Khalifa was responsible for Unit 8200, an elite force within the IDF's military intelligence. Multiple Israeli media outlets reported that a female NCO with 20 years of experience in dealing with Hamas 
made a series of reports detailing what could happen. Like the Walls of Jericho reports, she also detailed Hamas's plan to massacre and kidnap civilians and soldiers. Her commander, an NCO with 30 years of experience, was so concerned by her reports that he even cancelled his family holiday. Hearing that Khalifa was visiting their base, he was ready to confront him. But when confronted, Khalifa arrogantly dismissed the reports as mere hot air. He insisted the plan wasn't real, and Hamas's true intention was just to put on a show for its followers, showing off their strength and prowess. And thus, Khalifa reportedly did not communicate the NCO's report to either the head of Israel's security agency, the Shin Bet, or to the IDF chief of staff. But unfortunately for Khalifa and Israel's generals, the plot thickens further. The IDF utilizes what are known as field observers, or Tatsbitanyot in Hebrew. These are soldiers who monitor all of Israel's borders 24 hours a day using sophisticated surveillance equipment. It is a unit made up entirely of young female soldiers and commanders, and they had issued dire warnings in the month leading up to October the 7th. At the Nachal Oz base, where many of the observers served, only two women were not killed or captured on October the 7th. They were Maya Desiatnik and Yael Rottenberg, and both of them had much to say about what they saw. Rottenberg frequently saw Palestinians dressed in civilian clothing approach the border fence with maps and examining the ground beneath it digging holes. But when she passed the information on, like so many others, her concerns were dismissed. Desiaknik reported that she would see Hamas terrorists train at the border fence non-stop. At first it was once a week, then once a day, and then nearly constantly. And in addition to passing on this information about the frequency of training, she said she collected evidence which included how to drive a tank how to cross into Israel via tunnel. Other soldiers who recently finished their service before October the 7th gave similar reports on what they saw. They claimed they saw patrols along the border, people with cameras and binoculars, 300 metres from the fence. There were disturbances, people went down to the fence and detonated, in their words, an outrageous amount of explosives. Desiatnik ominously said, as the border activity increased, she realised it was only a matter of time before something happened. We can see a familiar pattern emerging. The young soldiers sent their warnings up the chain of command, but all of them were ignored. So this leads to the next important question in this episode. Why is it, despite all the warnings, Israel's security establishment refused to believe that an attack was on the way? Much of it can be explained by the fundamental misunderstanding and mischaracterization of Hamas that permeated through Israel's security establishment that crossed over many governments, chiefs of staff and intelligence heads. As the Israeli scholar Mordechai Kedar, himself an Arabic expert, explains, Hamas is first and foremost not a representative of the Palestinian people, but of Islamic ideology. Their ideology is 1,400 years old, and they are merely the current expression of this ideology. At other times, it has been expressed in different ways under groups with different names. Their motivation is first, last, and always a religious one. And the motivation for jihad is Israel's mere existence. Qadar states that even if Israel was a one meter square country on the coast of Tel Aviv, this alone would be enough to incite jihad for Hamas. This detailed political and theological understanding of Hamas was absent amongst Israel's leadership, who fundamentally believed that Hamas had become a rational organization. It was interested in governing Gaza and not attacking Israel. As Tablet Magazine reports, as far back as 2008, the former head of Shabak, Israel's internal intelligence service, assured a council on foreign relations that Hamas was sensitive to the will of the Palestinian people. Ayalon, who is a strongly left-wing figure, believed that Hamas would ultimately be measured, self-interested and attuned to the inner desires of the people it rules. However, as the article points out, it wasn't just the left who believed this, but Israel's right-wingers agreed with him as well. This wasn't just a military view, however. Many political leaders also held a similar perspective. In 2006, the Council on Foreign Relations, a US think tank, published a praiseworthy profile of Hamas Politburo leader Khaled Mashal. They described him as charismatic and possessing diplomatic skills. He is welcomed in open arms in various capitals and he's seen as a legitimate political actor. And Mashal was even described by Edward Peck, a former US ambassador to Iraq, as a man who is moderate in many senses and entirely rational. And yet, the day after Hamas slaughtered over a thousand Israelis, this supposedly moderate and rational man appeared on Qatari television, calling for the harassment of Zionists and their American allies, asking Mujahideen to go on long caravans to spill their blood on the land of Palestine. So with this all-prevailing worldview concerning Hamas, 
Israel's top brass could only receive warnings that contradicted this with disdain. As to admit that Hamas were a serious threat was to undermine over a decade's worth of consensus in which the top security officials in the country had staked their reputation and careers on a flawed worldview. It was this deadly cocktail of arrogance, complacency, and most importantly, conformity, that led to mountains of evidence being ignored and ultimately causing mass slaughter. The final thing that we will observe is that this conformity was no accident and shockingly, history has repeated itself as Israel has been in this situation before in almost exactly the same way. What's important to remember about Israel is that it's a country born into war. From the moment it declared independence in 1948, it was immediately invaded by five Arab countries and then has fought several more wars both large scale and small scale since then. There's not been a day of peace since that time in 1948 up to the present day. This constant war has led to generals becoming household names in Israel, whilst most of the publics in the UK or the US could not name the chief of staff of their military, let alone a high ranking general. The chief of staff in Israel is well known by everyone, as are many of the high ranking officers. Whilst already prominent members of society, following Israel's stunning victory in the Six Day War, the generals were elevated to superstar status. To be a general was to be part of an exclusive club, part of Israel's aristocracy, and a prominence which gave them influence far beyond the army itself. More often than not, the chief of staff of the IDF has become a member of Israel's parliament, and three army generals, Yitzhak Rabin, Ehud Barak, and Ariel Sharon, have all been Israel's prime ministers. However, in the euphoria of victory following the Six Day War, Complacency and groupthink seeped into a formerly dynamic military leadership. In order to defend Israel's new frontier with Egypt on the Suez Canal, it was decided that a series of fortifications would be built, known as the Bar Lev Line. This was at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. And just like Israel's security barrier on the Gaza border prior to October the 7th, this line of fortifications bred complacency in Israel. Although one of Israel's greatest generals, Ariel Sharon, warned of the dangers of a static defence, he was cast aside and eventually manoeuvred out the army. But the group think ran deeper. Israel's military leadership developed what was known as the concept. This was a preconception that the Arabs would only go to war with Israel again if they were sure they could win, discounting the possibility entirely that even an underprepared Arab army relative to Israel's power might launch a surprise attack. But this is exactly what happened. Despite Egypt and Syria's strength not being to the level that Israel thought necessary to launch an attack, on the 6th of October 1973, the Yom Kippur War began. Israel was caught completely off guard. Syria immediately made significant gains on the Golan Heights in the north. And on the Egyptian front, the once thought impenetrable Bar Lev line was overcome in a matter of hours, and Egypt was into the Sinai. The overwhelming Egyptian and Syrian attacks in 1973 had clear parallels to Hamas's attack on October the 7th. Both were catastrophic failures of a group of leaders who refused to look beyond their own assumptions and shunned and sidelined those who offered an alternative perspective which challenged their worldview. In the fullness of time, we will certainly find out more information about the planning and preparation for the October 7th attacks, both in terms of what Hamas had in store and other information about what Israel previously knew. Inquiries, both formal and informal, will go on for years, as will the debates as to who in Israel was responsible for this drastic failure. And as this war rages on, it's worth noting that the men who were responsible for this debacle are still in charge in Israel's military and intelligence ranks. Benjamin Netanyahu has proved to be no Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln, two civilian leaders who were happy to relieve generals of their command if they failed to meet their duty or if they were incompetent. So can the men who got Israel into this mess get them out of it? Can Israel's general staff overcome the malaise of conformity that has gripped them for the past 50 years? They pursued a policy of containment in all places, rather than an aggressive strategy designed to overwhelm their enemy and achieve victory. As the Israeli journalist Amos Harel states, in the multiple wars that Israel has fought since 1973, with the exception of Operation Defensive Shield, it's failed to decisively win a single campaign. But given the scale of Hamas's atrocities, will this time be different? Thank you for watching and please like, subscribe, share this video, Thank you to every single one of you who recently got me up to 200,000 subscribers. I could not be more grateful, seriously. And it's, what's so incredible about it is it was only eight months ago that this channel reached 100,000 subscribers. So absolutely incredible growth there. And an extra special shout out goes to my incredible Patreon supporters. Your names are on the screen right now. 
Now, you guys have stuck with me through the hardest times that this channel has been through, as I was demonetized for months. YouTube can be an incredibly unforgiving and unpredictable place at times, and it's support from you guys that keeps me going through it when you know the winds might not be blowing in your favor. So if anyone else wants to support the channel in this way through Patreon, there'll be a link in the uh, in the video description below. Please do so, do so. Different tiers, all support is appreciated. And as always, only only give if you can. Don't go beyond your means. Thank you. I want to hear what you have to say. Tell me your opinions. Should Israel have seen the attack coming? Countries receive intelligence of all sorts all the time. Was Israel really to know that an attack was going to take place, despite all the evidence that I've shown in the video? Let me know what your thoughts are, and also, what do you reckon about the war going forward? Where will it head, and what will the final conclusion be? Big subjects, I know, but I always want to hear what you've got to say, so just write in the comments. Thank you very much, and I will see you on the next one.